message is titled, Seeking the Lost. Uh, last week, the apostles were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in heaven. Uh, they were having this discussion, as we saw in the different gospels, uh, they were having this discussion away from Jesus as they were heading to the house and they were deciding who was going to be the greatest. And when they got to the house, I'm sure the discussion ended real quick. <laughs> and they go into the house and Jesus said, what were you talking about? <laughs> and they were like, oh, who? Oh, oh, uh, you know, and they didn't want to say, but Jesus knew their heart, we're told. He knew what was going on inside their heart. And he took a child and he placed him in the midst and he said, unless you become as this child, you can't be the greatest in heaven. As a matter of fact, you can't even get into heaven unless you become as this child. I'm, I'm sure that that shocked them. The focus at that point was heaven. Jesus was talking about getting into heaven and, and the rank in heaven. First of all, there's one that's the greatest in heaven. We know that. But the apostles were a little unsure. They wanted to find out who was second, you know, who was third. You know, they, they wanted the pecking order in heaven. Uh, so uh, here Jesus tells them, you know what, you have to become as a child to get into heaven and to be great in heaven. But now he's going to change the focus to the child. You see, children weren't really important in, uh, in that time. Uh, they were really just someone that's eating the food. Uh, you know, they, you can't send them out in the field at two years old. You know, but when they got old enough, they were out there working the farms, working, working the, the herds, and, and they got involved in things. But until then, they were just an obstacle. They were just in a way, and they weren't considered really important back then. And, and Jesus is going to explain to them wrong attitude. They really need to open their minds. So we continue our study through the gospel of Jesus Christ with Matthew chapter 18. We're going to pick it up in verse 6 where Jesus says, but whoever causes one of these little ones, I'm sure he's pointing to that little child that's there in front of him, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of of the sea. So here Jesus is pointing to this child now and, and saying, if you do anything to hurt this one, to cause this one to be in sin, uh, to neglect this child, then it would be better if you had a millstone. Now, the millstone wasn't one of these little things that you tie around your neck and you wear as a, a decoration. It, it isn't jewelry. The millstone that is referred to here is the one that the donkey pulls to, uh, you know, to mash the grain up, to uh, turn the whole mill around as this stone grinds the grain. And so that would be hung around the neck and you'd be thrown into the sea. There, there's no coming back from that. That's basically what Jesus was saying. You're, you're gone. You're, you're going to drown. The Jews weren't especially fond of water. As a matter of fact, the Jews didn't have their own navy. They didn't have their own merchant ships or anything, they used the Gentile merchant ships to transport all of their goods and their, their spices. And all of that was done through the Gentile merchant ships. Uh, we know that there were some issues when it came to the sea and the Jews. Look at Jonah. You know, the, he there was on the, the boat and the next thing you know, they throw him overboard because he's not listening to God. And then a great fish swallows him up and spits him out on the beach three days later. 
the Jews probably had that in their mind. Oh my goodness, I'm not going on a boat. I don't want to live inside a fish for three days, you know, because I know that I don't always listen to what God is telling me. And I can see them being, look at the life of Paul. Now, uh, at this time, Paul wasn't um, going out in ministry. This is before Paul had his ministry, but Paul was shipwrecked time and time again. He spent time out in the water. You know, you would think that Paul would get the message, stop taking ships, you know, just stay on land because you keep, you know, getting in trouble whenever you're on a ship. But their fear was so great that they didn't really appreciate the water. They appreciated what came out of the water, the fish, you know, and, and they had a great fishing ministry out there uh, in the Sea of Galilee. I'm, I'm going to now jump to verse 10. Uh, verses 7 and 8, Matthew was one that um, he must have got distracted a lot and then he would put uh, verses in between other verses, uh, sort of like me. And he now jumps in with verses 7 through 9 that are going to be connected to a teaching that we're going to do in a few weeks. But for now, verse 10 follows the flow of what um, Jesus was speaking of here. He said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. For the son of man has come to save that which was lost. So once again, Jesus is referring to the child now. He says, we shouldn't despise children and they shouldn't be despised by their caretakers, their parents or whoever they were, even the apostles. Uh, sometimes we think that God doesn't notice what's going on in our lives. But here, he lets us know that he cares so much about our lives, even as children, which the Jews didn't believe had much value. But he cared about their lives. The angels constantly see the face of God and then report back on what's going on in that child's life. What a picture it is. It, we often think of the picture of we all have a guardian angel, and, and I don't know that we have one guardian angel. Some of us need more than one, <laughs> you know, because of the trouble that we get in, you know. But either way, angels are constantly there interceding. They're constantly there interacting with God. And uh, I don't understand that picture. I haven't seen an angel like that. Or maybe I have. I just don't know. Be careful when you meet strangers. You might be entertaining an angel unaware. Uh, that's what the Bible says. So I digress. Uh, we can rest assured that he's fully aware of everything that takes place in our lives. No matter what's going on in our lives, sometimes we think God is not aware of what is happening. Otherwise, he would save me from this right now. I'm sure Jonah thought that on day one and day two and, and on day three until he got spit out on the beach. You know, he was thinking that God just forgot about me. And here I sit and, and this big fish. There are probably many times that God wanted to wipe me out. You see, we often think that, oh, since God hasn't done anything, since God hasn't hurt me, uh, I must be okay. I, I, you know, I must be doing okay. No, it's the fact that God is patient. So even those that mistreat young children can be forgiven of what they've done. It isn't immediate. You do something wrong and you're knocked out. You're gone. You're wiped out. God takes you out of the picture. If that were the case, I would have been out of the picture at 15. But God had a lot of patience with me, a lot of grace. Even after I became a believer, I still did things kind of my way. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure I was doing them for the Lord, but 
the Italian way, <laughs> the New York Italian way. It's a little different than maybe some other people and how they did things. But the fact of the matter is, God was patient. He already knew the beginning from the end. He knows every day that I'm going to be here. I don't know when I'm going to leave this earth. He does. And so he knew what I was going to become. And he said, okay, I'll put up with them for a little longer. No, that's not really what he said. He loves each one of us. Uh, even though we well, basically suffer our, the consequences of our own actions, we are the ones that get ourselves into trouble. We're the ones that make foolish choices, and then we have to suffer the consequences. Jesus doesn't say, okay, since you are a child, I'm just going to wipe that out since you're one of my children. No. If you continue to go down a road, he will let you, and then you suffer the consequences, and hopefully you learn from what takes place during those transactions, and then you come back to the Lord in repentance. He restores, he forgives. You don't come back and he starts beating you up because of what you've done. We're going to get to that later in our message. We're told in verse 11 that Jesus came to save that which was lost. Uh, and maybe Jesus is seeking to save an unbeliever who's trying to find their way. Uh, we don't know. We, we don't know if it's a child that he's seeking or if it's just someone that is lost in this world, looking for answers and looking to the world to provide the answers. But until they look up, they're going to be misguided, distracted. Lord of all creation and all his holy angels are aware. Nothing goes unnoticed with God. Jesus paints another picture of his love for the children in verses 12 through 14 but we're not going to read them because this is a parable where it's told in other, um, uh, other gospels. So Luke has more information, tells the same parable, but he provides more information in Luke chapter 15. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 15 now and we'll stay in there for the remainder of our study. Luke chapter 15 in verse 1 where we read, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance." So Matthew gives us the same account, but Luke gives us the amplifying information that Matthew doesn't provide. He talks about the tax collectors that drew near to him and sinners drawing near to Jesus at this time. Well, my mind immediately goes back to last week when we talked about Peter being outside the house. Jesus was inside the house. The tax collectors came to him and said, does your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter said, yes, he does. And then when he went inside, Jesus said, go, get your fishing rod, go hook a fish. The first fish that you hook is going to have a coin inside its mouth. It'll be enough to cover my temple tax and your temple tax. And so Peter went down fishing, right, to get the temple tax. Well, this image came into my head that as he's on his way down, who was outside the house in the first place? Um, uh, there were the 
tax collectors that had talked to him about collecting the tax. They haven't collected it yet, so they have follow him down to the water as he goes fishing, and he's there, you want to see something? Watch this. And he casts his line in, he pulls out the first fish, and, you know, I don't know if he, like, throws it at him. Say, here, here's your temple tax. Open his mouth. Or if he opened the mouth himself and pulled it out and said, here you go. They were probably like, what? What is that about? You see, Jesus knew what was going to happen. And those tax collectors, they just cared about collecting their tax. Really what they wanted to do is catch Jesus in a position where he wasn't doing what they expected him to do. And they had something to blame him for, accuse him of not paying the tax. But here, Jesus is sitting with tax collectors and sinners. And to me, that implies that those tax collectors saw something in Jesus that they wanted to come and hear from him. And now they're sitting together as Jesus is teaching them. And the Pharisees are there. And we know how the Pharisees are always trying to trap Jesus. It still happens today. There are many people out there that are Pharisees, always trying to find something in the Bible that they can say, oh, that, that's false. It contradicts what you know, this other scripture says. And they're always trying to find uh, apparent controversies. And I say apparent because there aren't conflicts in the Bible. It is all put together by God. And we have to know the, and understand the authors of each of these books to understand it, it is an apparent contradiction, but really it's just a picture from two different perspectives. It, it's someone standing on one corner and watching an accident and someone standing on another and watching an accident and they have two different stories of what they saw but that doesn't mean they contradict each other. It just means we get a bigger picture of what actually took place. And that's what the Word of God is. 66 books written by over 40 authors over a period of 2,000 years. Only God can do that and bring it together and have one central focus, the life of Jesus Christ, who he is and who he means to us. So I thank God that Jesus is sitting here eating with tax collectors and sinners. That means there's hope for us. We can sit with him. He will eat with us. Because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become part of the family. We're adopted into his family. We receive part of of that inheritance. So, Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep. When a shepherd loses one of his sheep, he has a hundred, he loses one, he doesn't say, eh, didn't like him anyway. You know, forget about it. A good shepherd will go after that one lost sheep. And so here we see that he leaves the 99 in the wilderness and then goes looking for the one sheep. Well, here's where it helps to have two different perspectives. Matthew writes that he goes to the mountains to look for the sheep. Here, Luke says he left the sheep, the 99, in the wilderness to go look for the one that's lost. Now, we have a better picture of what took place. He left the 99 to go into the mountains to find the one. You know how hard it is to find a lost sheep in the mountains? It's hard because sheep aren't very stable. They're, they're, they kind of look like this. Okay, and, and so as they're up on the rocks, moving around and stuff like that, if they slip and fall, they can't get back up. They, they don't have the ability to stand back up on their feet. They need someone to help them 
to get back up on their feet. And if they're laying there in a ditch in the mountains, you, he may be bleeding, you know, that's the noise they make, you know, and, and he may be doing that. And the shepherd may actually hear it, but not know where it's coming from because the echo is reverberating off of all of the walls. And it doesn't take long for that sheep to die. Uh, he won't last long if he falls over and is not able to get back up. Or there are predators that will come and grab that sheep. And so here the shepherd goes and looks for that sheep. He's trying to find it. And when he finds it, he rejoices. He doesn't go and beat the sheep. Why did you leave? He picks them up and he puts them on his shoulder. Well, that's a real sign of intimacy. That's a sign of love. And he puts them up and he brings them as close as he can on his shoulders and then he carries them back. And then there's a celebration. I found the sheep that was lost. And then in verse 7 it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who need no repentance. There's something unusual about that verse. You see, because I can relate to the one that needs to be saved, the one that needs to repent. I can relate to that. But the 99 that didn't need to repent, no such thing. You see, there are no just persons that don't need salvation. There are only those that just think they are just. There are those that believe that they're qualified to enter into heaven because of what they do for God. Uh, particularly the Pharisees. They thought they were covered because they just obeyed the law. They did everything perfect. And they really felt that there was no read. When they went out to John the Baptist, who was in the wilderness, and he's teaching in the wilderness, John the Baptist, by the way, didn't go into the city and yell at the Pharisees. He didn't go at the temple and yell at them saying, you need to get right with God. He didn't do that. What did John the Baptist do? He went to the wilderness and he preached out there. There were geckos getting saved and it was, but who was out there in the wilderness? No one except those that wanted to know the Lord. And they would leave and come out to the wilderness to see John the Baptist in his Brooks Brothers suit. No, he would wear camel hair. He had a leather strap around him. He ate locust and honey. That's like, I haven't seen any on the shelves. You know, it must be right there with the toilet paper. But he, that's what he survived on. Locust and honey out there in the wilderness. And people came to him to hear the message that he had to share. And what was the message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. What was Jesus' message when he first started his ministry? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message. And so here is John out there, and the Pharisees come out to find out what's going on. We heard a bunch of our people are coming out here, and he's dunking them in the water. He's baptizing them. What is going on out here? Now, it doesn't say that any of them were baptized. They weren't. As a matter of fact, he called them out. What are you coming out here to see? Why are you coming out here? To be saved? But then he always points to Jesus. It's not about his ministry. There, there's one that's greater. He's going to come. I'm not even worthy to unlatch his sandal. And he points to Jesus. The whole word of God points to Jesus. 
And here, Jesus says that there are 99 just people who need no repentance. Yes, they do. They just think they don't. They won't go to John the Baptist and repent. John was giving the, the repentance that wasn't leading to salvation. It was just acknowledging sin. I need to repent because I need to acknowledge my sin. I need to acknowledge the one that's greater. And then Jesus came and he took away the sin. He gives the true baptism. So we see that there are many that think that they are just. And that's still in the world today. Many people think that they're doing what it takes to get into heaven. You ask half the people on the street and say, half of them will say, I don't even believe in heaven. But the other half will say, yes, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm going to heaven. You know, I, I go to church on holidays and, and I believe in God. So I'm going to heaven because I don't do what my neighbor does. He's a jerk, but I'm a nice guy, you know? So because I'm a nice guy, I'm going to heaven. Him? He's, going, he's the one Jesus was talking about going to hell. So the ones who are lost are the tax collectors and sinners. They're sitting there while Jesus is ministering to them. And the Pharisees are sitting there trying to condemn him. They want to find something wrong with what he's teaching. Which group of people would you be sitting with today? If I were living back then, I don't know where I would be. I would like to think I would be sitting there at the feet of Jesus, but I don't know. And, and I am just so glad that he opened my eyes and made me aware of the truth so many years ago. Jesus now moves on to parable number two in Luke chapter 15, verse 8, where he says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's another picture of how God searches. Now, there are so many analogies. There are so many different things I can put into this text. Talking about the lamp being the Holy Spirit and illuminating the dark, looking for the coin. And there are so many things I can read into it. But I just want to take it simply. The last verse that... Jesus said, likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The one sinner being the coin that was found. Oh, the other nine coins, they're, they're fine. She had control over them the whole time, but it was that one coin that she found. And, and there was joy, there's a celebration. It's another picture of how God loves us. In verse 11, Jesus is now going to talk about a certain man that has two sons. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So there were these two sons, the older and the younger. And the younger said, I want 
what's coming to me. I want part of this inheritance. I, I want my fair share. And the father divides the estate. Notice it says that he divided to them his livelihood. It wasn't just to the younger son. He divided to both of them the li the, his livelihood, his estate. He gave to them what was coming to them at that time. The younger one said, I'm going to go set out on my own. I know I can do better than hanging out in this little 100 sheep town. I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a name for myself. I'm going to do something. And it says he went to a far country. Notice that the father didn't try to stop him. The father didn't say, don't, don't do that. That's stupid. You, you haven't learned enough yet. You haven't experienced this world yet. As we're raising children, we hope that they will glean from our experiences, good and bad. We hope that they will learn and say, I don't want to make that mistake, or I want to follow because I see success. In this. We hope that's what our children do. But quite often our children have ambitions and visions of their own of, of what they can do. And so they go out on their own. And that's what this young man does. Just like our heavenly father, he didn't try to stop the young man from leaving. See, our heavenly father won't stop us if we are going to try to leave our Heavenly Father won't say, you know what, don't do that. I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to cut you off. He doesn't do that. He says, okay, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. You go ahead and do that. Good luck. No, he doesn't say that. But he cares that we're going. He cares still. He loves us. But he lets us go. He's not going to force anyone into a relationship with him. And so he sets out. And I believe he went to a far country because he didn't want word getting back about what he was doing, about how he was blowing all his money, about how he was living his life. He went to a far country. He wanted to get away from where he had been so nobody would know. He spent everything he had. It was all gone. I'm sure all those people that were his friend while he was spending the money, when it ran out, they were like, see ya. They weren't there for him. They weren't there to say, okay, you blew all your money on us. Let's invite you in and you can stay at our place while this famine goes on until it's over. Instead, he had to join himself to someone from that country, meaning that he was an indentured servant. He got enough to stay alive while he went out and he served that man, whoever he was, feeding pigs to the point where it was like, oh, that looks good. That looks good. I, I've never been to that point in hunger that I looked at animal food and thought, oh, that looks good. Now, I have eaten dog food once uh, because as kids, everyone has, you know? You know, the, hey, look, the dog really likes that, you know? And, and those nuggets look really tasty. It wasn't. So he realized, you know what? Even my father's servants, they eat better than this. They have enough left over, even, to have leftovers. They you know, are treated much better than this. I want to go back. I want to let my father know that I was wrong. I don't even deserve what he is offering, even to his servants. I don't even deserve that. But I was willing, I'm willing to go and to do that. It's a sign of repentance. It's a sign of asking for forgiveness. And this is true repentance as he recognizes that he's not worthy at this point to be called a son because of what he's done. He's taken everything that his father had to offer and he squandered it. 
and now he has nothing and he's coming back with nothing and he realizes I have nothing to offer and I don't deserve anything. We deserve nothing. But God in his grace, in his mercy and his love for us pours out his mercy and grace upon us. He gives us what we don't deserve and he doesn't give us what we do deserve. He loves us so deeply. And in verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. The father sees the son coming and it says, afar off, he sees him coming. Probably smelt him coming too. He knew that it was his son as he's coming from afar off. But you know what that tells me? He was looking for him. He was keeping an eye out. He wanted to see when his son returned. And here he was returning and he saw him afar off. And he didn't sit on the throne and say, wait till he gets here. I've got something to tell him. No, he ran to him. He hugged him. He loved him. And then he said, give him the robe, the royal robe. Give him the signet ring. He's part of the family. Put sandals on his feet. And bring them in. We're going to have a party. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. Sometimes we go to the Lord and we know we don't deserve a party. We don't deserve a robe. We don't deserve a ring. But he has them there for us anyway. He's ready to put the robe around our neck. He's ready to put new shoes on our feet, to give us the ring that signifies that we're part of the family. He's ready to do that for us. But sometimes we feel like, oh, I'm not worthy. I've got news for you. You're not. None of us are. None of us are worthy. But it's his great love that makes it possible his love for us that includes us in the family of God. We're children of the living God. It's something that isn't just given to anyone on the street, only those that ask for it by connecting with Jesus Christ, who he is, who he is, what he has done for us. He died for us so that we can have that relationship with his father. And he is the only begotten son, the only one qualified to be called the son. But the father said, I'm going to make a way to call them all sons and daughters of the living God. I'm going to make a way. What an awesome story. This is the greatest story ever told. And and it's the story we need to hear right now, especially with what's going on in the world today. God doesn't hold our sin against us when we repent. He doesn't say, okay, but don't do this and don't do this again. And, you know, I, I don't want to hear that you went there and you... He doesn't do that. He loves us. He throws a party. Looking forward to it that party. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field. This is big brother. And he came and drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. I, I don't know how he heard dancing. Maybe they were wearing clogs. 
It was river dance. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was very angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is live again. He was lost and is found. So here's the older brother, a picture of maybe a believer who has walked with the Lord all his life and he was always the good son doing whatever his father asked of him, being obedient and he became jealous because of his brother who may have backslid Okay, he did. He backslid. He took the money and he ran and he spent it all and now he's coming back to his father. And he didn't want to forgive him. Paul dealt with the same thing with the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 when the Corinthians didn't want to let someone back in the church. Now remember in 1 Corinthians chapter, I don't remember, 5, um, Paul told them to cast someone out of the church because he was in sin. And so, uh, so 2 Corinthians chapter 2, now he's saying, well, if they repent, you let them back in. You show love to them. Now, we don't know if it's the same exact person that did this, but either way, they were not welcoming a person back that repented. They, they didn't feel the love. You know? And uh, for me, I know that that can be hard because, you know, you expect everyone to live up to your standard, right? My standard stinks. God's standards are much higher than my standards. And if he receives someone that's a sinner when they repent, I the more so should. All of us should. All of us should say, you know what? If God accepts that person, I'm accepting that person back into my life. The, uh, this brother doesn't feel that way. He just feels like I've done everything right. I've lived my whole life as a Christian and I've done everything right. And I, I shared the gospel with this guy who was a creep. <laughs> he, he was in jail for years and then he gets out of jail and he's still a creep. And, and I, I told him he needs Jesus and he repents. I spent my whole life and what now all of a sudden he repents and he gets to be in the same place that I am he gets to sit at the same table he gets the same benefits yes because he went his whole life miserable he lived his whole life not being connected to God when I wasn't connected to God when I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ my life was miserable I was, I was so empty. I was never happy. Although I, I tried to fake it, I was never happy. But then, entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ, I found peace. I, I found joy. I, I found that my void was filled. See, I don't know if this other son was saved even. He was going through the motions and sometimes we can intellectually have a knowledge of God and go through the motions but not have a relationship with him experiencing the joy and the peace that we can have from him because it's all here in our heads. We're content mentally with what God is doing. But until we have that relationship, until we experience 
the forgiveness of God, the peace of God, we can't experience that joy. Here's a picture of the father forgiving the son and restoring him and giving him his place back in the family. We close remembering this. God is seeking the lost. And when we receive that gift of salvation offered by Jesus Christ, we become children of the living God. We now have an inheritance that can't be taken away from us. But that doesn't mean we can't walk away. God is not going to hold us and say, no, you can't leave the house. Oh, if you want to leave, you can. But you'll never be satisfied out in the world. Once you have the experience of walking with the Lord, you can never be satisfied when you leave the house again. You know, I, I, I always pictured it like once you experience my mother's cooking, you just can't be satisfied with any other food. It's the greatest cook until I married Cheryl. And then I said, okay, there is some better food out there. And, and she makes some great, even my mother said, oh, she makes a better lasagna than I do. My mother was Italian and, and, and she makes a better lasagna. And, and so uh, I realized that sometimes we think that there's something better out there and we don't appreciate what we already have that God has already blessed us with in our own lives, our own homes. So we need to stay and stay focused. The good news is God doesn't hold anything against us when we return home. He welcomes us home with open arms and then there's a party in heaven. A party. And, and there's parties going on all the time in heaven. I can only imagine. I can't wait to get there because we're going to be part of those parties when we get there. We're going to be part of the celebration there. In the meantime, remember that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And Jesus loves you so much that he did what his father called him to do, that he was obedient to what his father had for him. Fact is, God knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. He even knows the ones that aren't there anymore. He has them all numbered. He knows everything about you. And he can't wait to see you face to face when we enter into glory. In the meantime, keep looking up and keep looking to his word for the answers because that's where we can find the answers to this life. The 99 think everything is okay. They're happy with and content with their lives. That's where the 99 are. They're in for a shock. But we, when the time comes, will be part of a celebration that will go on forever. Amen? Amen.